Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 today. Good to see you. Well, if you're joining us online, welcome. We are part in part of a series where we're talking about being an influence in our communities, changing our world, changing the world. And uh, so we're excited about that. It's kind of going along with small groups. If you're in a small group, you know, we're kind of moving everything towards making a difference through Serve Day, which is July 13th. I <clears throat> hope that you can be part of that. Serve Day, just in case you're new with us or you're not sure, a serve day is one day out of the whole year, we collectively are going to come together and we're going to do something to serve other people. And it'll look different for different people. Now we do have projects in our serve day app. If you're not sure what to do, or maybe you never got connected in with a small group, then you can just show up here around 830 in the morning and we're just going to serve for about three hours. We have different projects that will launch out from here. So again, if you're not sure, just be here, show up, come with your red shirt. We'll do it together. It's going to be great. Uh, I love to be able to make a splash in our community. We just kind of had a dream. We started last year. We thought, hey, what if we were to bring together the six, 700 adults that make up Vineyard Community Church all at one time, go and do something all over the community. And, uh, and, and it really impacts people. I think it's a great way to do that. You may say, well, Andy, that's outside my comfort zone. I don't know if I'm gifted. Well, so my response to that is, is get over it. No, I, no, just come on out. Well, you know, you don't... You know, we have different projects, and so you can look at some or just, you know, you know, not real people oriented, you know, or you can just like be a servant behind the scenes. Lots of different, we have lots of ways for you to get involved, but you know, it's, it means, it means something to people when we, when we serve. It says something about the church, it says something about our church, but it also says something about the church. And so uh, one of the things that we're going to encourage you to do is uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, put in serve day 19 for your hashtag. That way we can share photos, take photos, take videos, uh, and you can see what other people are doing. We certainly will use some of those uh, for our weekend service on that, on that weekend as well. So, uh, so I'm excited about it. I hope you are. Hope you, hope you uh, come out and join us for those few hours. Well, we are in this series, what, part two, of making a difference in people's lives, changing our world. We're talking about stewarding our influence. And the reason we're talking about that because is God has given each person, every one of you, has a certain measure of influence that you, are to, you can use, choose to use or not to use. And that really begs the question. Some people would say, hey, should I even be trying to influence people around me? You know, we, we live in a culture and our culture is very dynamic. It doesn't stay the same. And so culture sometimes starts to get more towards God, embraces godly values, does, you know, a culture can, can be very God-honoring, and they can also go the other direction. Now, what I've seen over the last several decades is it is going the other direction. It's getting further from God. Our culture is not getting closer to God. It's getting further to go from God. And you see that in all kinds of different things that, 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 that pop up all in our culture. And, and so it's our, part of our job is to influence our culture, to be an influence in it. We're not supposed to be neutral. We're not supposed to just stand on the sidelines. We're supposed, we're supposed to play a role in that. We impact the culture around us. And so that's part of what, what we're going to talk about today. Certainly it's part of uh, the series that we're looking at, is how can we best be that, that culture around us. Now, I have a, a, a Scripture verse from the Old Testament, one from the New. First is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, his culture, in, when he's speaking, his culture is on the downswing. 
He sees it getting worse. It's not his imagination. He sees it. Hey, we were God honoring. Uh, now we're not. It's getting worse. And so he is speaking to people that he's saying, hey, you can be an influence. And here's what he says. He says, you are to influence them. This is God speaking through Jeremiah, because Jeremiah is a prophet. Do not let them influence you. So you have a kind of a choice. All of us do. You can either be influenced by the culture, and you're kind of passive, and you just kind of, you know, hey, it's not my fault. Or you can say, hey, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually play a role in changing the culture around me for, for good. He says, you are to be, an, you're to influence them. Then a New Testament verse here, Paul is speaking about the, how there's a concentric circle kind of keeps going out of our influence. We influence ourselves. We, have, we influence people around us. We end up influencing the world. And he says here, he says, the area of influence God assigned to us. Now he's talking about himself. Paul was called uh, into uh, professional ministry at some point. He gathered a team. They ended up planting a church in Corinth. And he's speaking to them. He's saying, hey, God gave me an assignment. And I ended up influencing you guys. I ended up, you know, impacting you and reaching you. God did that for me. I was in Arizona years ago, uh, over 30 years ago. I, uh, I thought I was going to go into business. God kind of shook my world up. And all of a sudden, I felt like, hey, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be kind of in professional ministry. It wasn't it, never on my radar. Never I would have thought of that at all. And so uh, then I started pursuing that. I was going to do that in Arizona. I was going to start a church there. I'd already gone through an apprentice program and all. And then God gave me a, this dream, very impacting dream, where I knew that I was supposed to leave Arizona and come to Virginia. And, and so I did that. I came here, went to seminary, and... Uh, I ended up meeting Sharon. She introduced me to the vineyard, and I and we started a church. And because God reached me, we were able to reach m many of you. Many of you were reached because of the vineyard. And so, same kind of thing. The area of influence God assigned us and Sharon, myself, our church planting team, to reach you. But it doesn't stop there. He says, "But our hope, there's a greater hope of something, is that your, as your faith increases, so now you you will increase in your faith." In other words, something it doesn't just stop with you coming to Christ, you being reached. But now your marriage is getting better, and you're able to uh, work through conflict at work better now, and you're able to sleep better now, and you're able to get along with your kids better now. You're able to have peace in your life through difficult circumstances better now. All of those things are increasing, but it doesn't stop there. He says our area of influence may be greatly enlarged. In other words, even beyond yourself, not just what's happening in your life, but now God uses you to influence people so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you, lands beyond you, just not just with ourselves. And so there's this, this flowing, this domino effect of more and more that happens. And God desires us to be influencers. We're supposed to be influencers in our culture. We're not supposed to just stand on the sidelines. Now, in 1975, there's two men. One was Lauren Cunningham. He was the founder of YWAM Youth with a Mission. And Bill Bright, who, who's deceased now, he was the founder of Campus Who Saved for Christ. They happened to be in the same city. They decided to hook up for lunch. And the day before, the night before they had lunch, uh, they both had a dream. They didn't know about it. They were in different hotels. And God kind of woke them up, gave them this vision and this dream. And it was so impacting, they got up and they wrote out what God had showed them. And it was about affecting society, affecting culture. So they meet up for lunch. They're sitting across from each other. Lauren says, hey, before we go any further, God gave me this incredible dream and I wrote it down. I need to share it with you. Bill goes, you've got to be kidding. I had the same thing happen to me. I had a dream God gave me. It was so impacting. And I wrote it down. I was going to, I need to share it with you. They both pull out their piece of paper. It's the same thing. They have the same thing listed out, list of things that, of, of how they can influence culture, how, how Christ followers can be influenced and how, how culture gets influenced. God gave it to them both in order to confirm his word that, it, that really this is, the way culture is influenced. So I wanted to share this with you. I told you where it came from. You can look it up if you want. There's more information on, on the internet, of course, on that. Here's, here, and they call them mountains or streams of influence. The first one is the church. Now, listen, these seven areas can either be 
be God glorifying. They're, they're, they're motivated. They're like principalities of good or of evil. And so, and, and they can do good or they can do it. Now, the church, I would have to say the, that six, six out of the seven right now are really under the kingdom of darkness. That's their primary way of being influenced. This is the, the, the one that is questionable. The church, is the, is the church really doing its job? See, for a lot of people, in our country at least, we've been taught this lie that your faith is something you keep private. It's just, some, just between you and whatever you got going on. But don't bring it out. At a, it's not supposed to affect society. You're not supposed to talk about it. You keep it to yourself. You know, the separation of church and state, they'll throw out, you know. By the way, tr- separation of church and state, that was written to talk about how the government shouldn't influence the church, not the other way around. Not the other way around. And, and, and when you read the Bible from cover to cover, we are supposed to be influencers in our in our society, in our culture. But that doesn't happen if, you're, if you buy into the lie that you're not supposed to say anything, that you're supposed to be private, that you keep it all to yourself. And there's been a whole generation of people that have been taught that, that have grown up believing, oh yeah, I'm supposed to just not say anything. You can't influence if you don't say anything. And so you speak up. Certainly this is an influencer in culture. Another one would be government. Government, public policy, puts their stamp of approval on what is good and what is evil. And you really see this kind of playing itself out more and more in our culture, where you have less discussions about what about law and more about morality and things that are, they're, they're deciding whether it's legal or not, but the, the argument behind it is, hey, that's immoral, whether it's about the environment or about, uh, of course, abortion and, and the right to life and all, or, or uh, the immigration issue. I mean, it's on and on and on. It's, 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 people are getting it. Hey, there's, there's, this is a cultural thing that affects us, and it's, there's a moral thing. Do you think the church should speak into things that are moral and not? Well, of course. And so we play an important role in that. Uh, arts and, ed, and entertainment. Another key thing that, that uh, a mountain or this, this stream into culture that impacts it. Art, entertainment, that includes, of course, fashion and sports. I love sports. Sports is cool, you know, and, and people speak out on and sports as leaders in, in that area. But it also with, the, like, movies and with sitcoms. You know, with movies and sitcoms, most people in the culture, in our culture, do not go to church, but they go to movies. And they, and they, and they watch lots and lots of TV. And that's how many of them are forming what they believe is right or wrong about, about everything. And so the script writers, not the actors, they're just the hired hands. The, the script writers, they're the ones that are influencing our culture more than sermon writers right now. Huge impact in our culture, influencing them. And it, by and large, to, to the, they're not going to the Bible and saying, how can we glorify God? How can we be biblically rooted? No, they're they're, they're, they're taking the culture in a different direction. Then education. Education, obviously, helping to form and mold heart, minds and really heart issues, what is true about God, what is not, especially young, young people, young minds. You know, just 100 years ago, you had, you had universities that were biblically founded, like Harvard and Yale, Princeton, and other Ivy League schools. That was their foundation. They, they had biblical principles. They were founded that way, and they, and they continued to integrate biblical principles through their curriculum and all the disciplines. Not anymore. Now it's, it's secular humanism, and, and, and certainly is not God-honoring. And then business is another mountain or stream into culture. You know, how money is either consecrated to, for, for the kingdom of God and advance good things, or to be used for selfish things and used for, for the kingdom of darkness, frankly. I mean, it, it, can, it can go the other direction. Media is another one with uh, the news outlets, blogs and magazines, TV, all kinds of media that, is, that is, is more and more or less, you know, like unbiased. There's not that value as much anymore. It's, it certainly is directing one direction or the other. And then family is another one. Family is another institution that, that, that impacts culture. And if you study uh, families that are strong over in cultures, 
Their societies are strong. When a family is strong, when a family is built on biblical values, you can go back 5,000 years and you'll see this is true. That when a family collapses that the, and the, throughout a society, the culture collapses and the society collapses. And the, and the reverse is true. So they all play an important role. What I see is, is I see it more like a, a wheel. And the church is the hub. And these are all spokes to influence the culture all around us. But we have that opportunity. We have that responsibility of, of, of not letting a fear get us. But we step into it and we say, I want to be part of the solution, part of the influencing part of this. And, and really, you're only responsible for your life. Not for the people, not, not for people before you or after you. The generation, a lot like King David. King David, it says, after David passionately served God's desires for his generation, he died. I love that as an epitaph. I mean, that's all I want to do. I wouldn't mind having that for me, you know. And he served, you know, God's passion, God's desires passionately for his generation. And then it's over. Then he died. And you get, you know, if you might live 70, 80, 90 years. And then the first, you know, 10 or 15, maybe not overly influential, maybe the, the end, not as much. And so you get a few decades, you know, three, four, five decades, and that's your opportunity to not shy away and not to be afraid and not to, because, I mean, it is like a war, right? I mean, there's, there's a, it's a spiritual warfare. I know, I know that people that fight for us, for our freedom, when they're in the middle of a battle, there's often fear. When they write books, they talk about how, how, how much they had to overcome fear. That's, often we have to do that. When, when, we're, when we're influencing culture, being ostracized, that can feel pretty lonely when you're at work and you're the only one standing up for biblical values or you're only, the only one standing up and maybe you're worried about your, your livelihood and if you get a raise or maybe even lose your job. There's a lot to be afraid of. And so our job is just your generation. That's all, you know, just your generation. You stand up and you stand up for what's right and you be an influence. You be an influence. That's all you can do. Jesus said, he said, you are like salt for the whole human race. Say salt with me. Salt. Don't you like salt? I think that's why I use that. I mean, salt's pretty cool. I love, I, that's one of the reasons I love French fries so much. French fries are just an excuse to have more salt. You know, I mean, they, whatever they put on it is never enough for me. I like, oh, you can put some more on, then I grab some packs and salt. You might be thinking, Andy, you're eating fries and all that salt, you have a problem. You need to see a nutritionist. Shannon and I, years ago, we went to a, um, uh, a dinner theater. And this one was kind of like, I think we got a coupon. So we decided, let's try this out. We didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. It was down at the oceanfront. So we go down, and it has a, it's themed for uh, back in the Middle Ages. And so we sit down, and they're like bringing food in stages, so it's like a five-course meal, and, and the, 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 serve, the, the people that are serving us are women, and they're like dressed in this crazy garb, and, and, they, and they won't answer you, they won't serve you, won't answer you, won't come, unless you call them a winch. And I know, I, at, that, at that point, we're starting to wonder what in the world is going on, you know? Hey, winch, come over. They had, they had this, this, these stocks, the, and I didn't know what they were. What's those stocks up there? I didn't know if it was just a prop. It turns out they picked somebody out of the group that did something wrong. Evidently, it was me. I don't even know what I did. <laughs> I did something wrong, and they come. You're in the stocks. They put me in the stocks. I'm in there, and then they pass cabbage out for people to throw it at me. <laughs> Sharon's eating her food. I'm thinking, what did I? I paid for this. What in the world? I, I, the coupon was not worth it, you know? So, I'm, so anyways, I come out of the stocks eventually, and anyways, we're sitting there, and we're eating, and the food tastes horrible, because evidently, in the Middle Ages, salt was hard to get a, to get a hold of, and it was expensive, and they told you that up front, hey, listen, there's no salt on any of the food, because it's expensive, back, you know, and they were pretending they were in character, you know, it's expensive, so, so you have to earn it. And you had to like answer riddles and do these answer questions. And, and so, I mean, I'm working real hard because my, my food tastes terrible. I got, finally, I won a little bit of salt. You know, Sharon goes, can I have some that? No, earn your own, you know. <laughs> so I sprinkle it in. It tasted great. All of a sudden, my soup. Hey, now, now we're talking. I need some salt on it. Salt makes things better. 
That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying you are to be salt. You're to make things better. That's how we influence our culture. That's why we serve. Not just on serve day, but certainly that's part of it. But we serve. That's why we have big shirts. It's serve. We want, that's what we're doing. That's, that's what we're about. You'll get a shirt on the way out. Serve. We don't, we, we're doing that. We don't hand you out like a sandwich board that says, you know, you know, you're going to hell, you know, if you don't believe what I believe. You know, that's, the, you know, hell. That's, it's two syllables if you're from the country. You're going to hell. That's not very nice, is it? I, whatever. Let me move on. But we're, that's not what we're telling people. You better believe the way we believe. You better act the way we act. They're the world. They're not going to. And so we have to gain an entrance. We want to be salt. We want to make things better. We want to, we want to make, help them. And then they start saying, hey, look, we start to gain a hearing. These people make, they're really interested in me. They care about us. They care about my business. They care about what's going on. And then we start to, we're able to be salt. And we start to talk about what it means to be a follower of Christ. Jesus said in the same passage, just a little further down, he says, let your light shine so that others will see the good that you do and will praise your Father in heaven. So we are to shine a light in darkness. There is a kingdom of darkness. People are in darkness. They don't know what to do. They, they're just doing whatever they, they have been taught in school or what has been passed down generally, generationally in their family and all kinds of things. And, and so we bring the light, but it is light. We are to bring light. We're supposed to, so that it points to, it points to the Father in heaven. So that's, we have a role. We are to influence. Jesus clearly says it. He says, hey, you're supposed to be influenced. Paul said, you can be an influence. Jeremiah, God says to Jeremiah, you can be an influence. Why should I be an influence? And, and well, I think the why is really important. We need to ask some important questions because when we ask those, those questions behind what we're doing, it motivates us because it's not easy. The easy route, make no mistake, I know it as well as you, the easy route is just to go with the flow. Not, don't make waves, you know, just kind of just go with the flow. But that is not the way God wants you to live. He wants you to live for something bigger than that. You are to make a difference. He says, don't forget to do good things for others and to share what you have with them. These are the kinds of sacrifices that God pleases, that pleases God, excuse me. So the reason why we do it is because it pleases God. God loves it when we are influencers for good, when we are salt, when we are light, when we are, when we are serving others, when we are loving others. You want somebody to love you? Love what they love. Care about what they care about. Yep. Now, God loves us regardless, but certainly that Jesus said that sometimes we think that God's all about the church and that he's just kind of tolerating the world. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I love the church, but the world, oh my goodness, that offends me. Don't, no, that's not at all what's going on. Jesus said that at one point, he says, he, God would leave 99 of those who are found to go find one that is lost. Yes. See, if you've ever lost something, you know how that feels. I mean, you, everybody's lost stuff, right? You've lost your keys or your wallet or something. And when I lose my wallet, man, I'm like all about that. I'm like, that's, it, that's all I can think about. I don't go through my house and think, well, my couch is there. I'm glad I, I have that. You know, well, I didn't lose the toaster or whatever. I mean, I, I mean I, I'm, it's all about, I've lost that. And that's what kind of consumes me. And you know what I'm saying, right? And that's what God is. is he says, I am all about the world. God so loves the world. He loves the world. He's, he, it, that's his passion. It's a form of worship. Not just when we sing. When we're serving, when we go out on July 13th together and we serve, that is, that is one of the greatest forms of worship. One of the greatest forms of worship is because we're serving. We're doing what pleases God. Those are the sacrifices that please God, and that's why we do it. That's a big part of why we're motivated to, to serve because it's, it, God loves it. Mother Teresa said, we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. It's so simple but so true. This is God's plan. God's plan is, is that you are his hands and his feet to show the love of God. He has no plan B. That's it. It's us. You are to be the influencer, and you're to do it 
through being salt and being through light. Their Ephesians gives us a second reason. Why? It says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. In other words, you were created all along to do this. This was your destiny. It was your, the purpose, that why you exist, which God prepared in advance way before you were born. He had this in mind. If you were breathing, that's why. When you come to Christ, why do you think that he doesn't just whisk you to heaven? Heaven's better. It's because he wants you to make a difference in people's lives. He leaves you here to make a difference. And we're supposed to do that with our life. For some of you, your life is not all that exciting. You're kind of in the routine. You're thinking Monday comes with alarming regularity. You know, I have to go back to work. And I don't really care for it. I'm in this rut. I'm in this hole. Uh, it's just, it's so bland. It's so hard. And listen, God has a plan for you that you're supposed to be living that is filled with purpose. But it's not just maybe what you've been living. It might be the unlived life. The life of, of, of what he's talking about here. When you have a life, you realize, oh, from the beginning, God designed me to be salt and light, to serve others. He says to do good works created in Christ Jesus. That's what, we're, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And so when we get on board with God's plan, all of a sudden, it changes our outlook. It changes why we live. We're not just living for retirement and living for the weekend and living. I mean, we have something bigger that we're living for. And it's really what God designed all along. So that's why we're to do that. So where should I influence others? Where do I, how can I, where do I do it at? Well, here, here's the simple answer to that. You're to influence the world. You're to change the world by changing your world. Your world. You have your own world, your own sphere of influence. And, and most of our spheres of influence is, is, is you're real close to a few people. And then you have acquaintances and you're less close to other people. It's kind of, it's, it's, you, have, you have, and some of you are leaders in those areas we looked at, in education and in, in, uh, in politics, in, in you know, government, in, in arts and science, I mean, arts and education, all those different areas we just looked at. And you have, you have an influence, but some of you, you, yours is in family, or you might have other ways of influencing, but it, you change the world by changing your world. And God will never ask you to do something that he hasn't already equipped you to do. Doesn't mean you can do it on your own. You certainly lean in to God helping you, and certainly that God will bring other people alongside, and we do things often together as teams, because we can accomplish more together as, as teams. But he equips you. I love what he did with Moses. Moses was just, you know, here he's a shepherd. God goes to him and says, hey, I want to use you to deliver my people. They've been in slavery for 400 years. There's a powerful government that is keeping them in bondage, the Egyptian government at that time. And he says, and I'm going to use you to free them. Pharaoh doesn't want them to go, but you're going to make it happen, Mo. <laughs> it's going to happen. And, and, and I'm going to help you. And Moses goes, hey, listen, my resume is not very good. He goes, I've murdered somebody. I have a stutter. I mean, you're asking me to do these things that, you know, are going to make it real hard. And so he, he says, well, what do you have in your hand? Because he was a shepherd. So he had this shepherd staff. He goes, well, all I have is a, this staff. That was his identity. That was what he was. He knew about that. And God ends up using that. He says, lay that down. He ends up consecrating that. And he ends up using that powerfully to deliver the people out of Israel, part the Red Sea, give them water in the wilderness. Over and over, you see the staff showing up. That was just designed, you know, I mean, it's, it's like if somebody asked you, you know, what's in your hand? If you were like a carpenter, well, I've got a drill, you know, I've, I've got a saw, I've got a hammer. It's, it's, he says, that's all I have. It's, it's part of his work identity. But God uses that and says, I'm going I'm to transform that and do something great through it. And that's what he does is he will use just as you are, your identity, the things you're, you're, you, you can relate to, but he will, he will use them to influence people around you. So that's how we influence our world. It says, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given. Not work, the work. See, all of us have work, but the work is something bigger than that. It's something God's called you to. 
It's, it's, it's a greater mission. And he says, and then when you figure that out, he goes, and then sink yourself into that. That's what we do. That's how you do it. You say, take like an eval, an eval, you know, an assessment. God, what have you given me? What am I good at? What can I do? And then sink yourself, you sink yourself into that. He says, I am only, this is Helen Keller says, I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. Now, she was, as you know her story, she was born blind and deaf. So she certainly had reasons to make excuses why she can't do things, why she can't influence her culture. But instead, she ends up radically influencing her culture and pointing people to the Lord. And she's the first woman in our country that ever got a bachelor's degree who was blind and deaf. I mean, it just she did some amazing things with her life. She goes, I'm not going to let that stuff get in the way. So we can all make an influence. And then how to influence most effectively. How do we use our one and only life to influence people the most effectively? Well, when you put your faith in Christ, the God says he comes and he strengthens you. His Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. That's why the, the Bible calls our bodies the temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, if you've ever heard that phrase. What it is is there, we have this, this, house, this body becomes the dwelling place of, of, of God when we invite him into our life. He doesn't just go around and come into anybody's life. He, he waits to be invited. And we say, yes, I want God into my life. I want his Holy Spirit in my life. And when we do that, we part, We have now a partnership. We say, God, I'm surrendering to you. I want to know your direction. But he's waiting for us to do that every day. Every day you get up, you say, God, use me to make a difference. Speak to me. I want to be your words. Be sensitive to the Spirit's promptings. And so how do you do that? Well, it begins each day when you get up and you say, God, use me. Today, I want to be that person. I want to be the person who serves in your name. I don't have it in my own ability to love like I need to love. I tend to be harsh. I tend to be judgmental. I tend to be uh, critical. I tend to have kind of a negative view of things. I, 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 I run thin easily. I snap. I, I, I run off, off the, with my language and blow, you know, let, blow my top and all those kinds of things. And we just, each day, it's, it's an important surrender prayer. Say, God, today, with your help, I'm going to do it. And then when we're talking to people, we listen to them. One ear, listen with, with, to them. And then the other ear is, is given to God. Say, God, speak to me. Because God has something to say about the conversations that you're in. And he has something to say about the people you, that are around you. Sometimes we're, we can influence our world and we're not even aware that there's a need in our world, the people around us. You know, there's probably people sitting right next to you in your row that are having a hard time. Could you use some help in some way? Maybe an encouragement, maybe a smile, a hug, maybe, maybe some other kind of practical way of, and, and, and it's so easy to not even know that. At the end of the service, we'll be wrapping this up in just a few minutes. You could get up and leave and never know that somebody right next to you was in incredible pain. How are you going to know that? Well, we're so busy. You know, when we fly, nobody liked window seats anymore. But remember back in the day when you got a window seat? Now you're like, it's a punishment, right? Because then you have to get out past two people to go to the bathroom and all that stuff. But, you know, you'd look out the window and you'd see this big city, but in a plane, right, you're going five, 600 miles an hour. So, the, you know, it's a massive city of, you know, two million people and it just, just flies, right? You know, a few minutes is gone. You, you don't see anything in detail. But when you're driving, because you're going slower, you see more detail, right? You're driving on a road trip, cow, you know, <laughs> tree, you know, you, just, you see it all. When we slow down, we can notice details. And the truth is that hurry is often the enemy of love. We get just going too fast. And we won't see the things around us. They can be sitting right next to us. They could be in your home. Somebody in your home in, uh, in a lot of pain. And you just, well, why are you so grumpy? Well, maybe, maybe there's something going on. 
or somebody at work or on and on. We just get going so fast, and so we need to slow down. That's a big part of it. And part of being sensitive to the Spirit's promptings is slowing down, kind of dialing things down a little bit in your own soul. And a great time to do that is each day, each morning. It's a fresh day. His mercies are new every morning. You may have blown it the day before, but it's a fresh day, a fresh beginning. And I love that verse. Sometimes I need that verse. God, you know, your mercies are new every morning. Thank you for all the mercy for yesterday because I screwed that one up. I need help today. I need help today. And then just to be real practical, find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. I mean, how much more practical can you be for that? You're just looking for it. That's what we're doing on the 13th. Saturday morning, we're just people went out and they found some needs and they said, we can fill that. We can fill that. Can we do them all? No, but we're doing some. I can do that. We can fill that. That's a hurt. We're going to be there for that. And sometimes they go together. You have a need and, there's a, and then God reveals a hurt to you. And so certainly that's my prayer for you is, is that when you go out on serve day, you don't just go to serve, you know, but that you're going as a, as a commissioned emissary for Jesus. You're going to look for hurts because they'll be there. I guarantee it. They're there. And God will want to use you to influence that world that you'll be in and and, 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 and the world that we live in each day, of course. We'll close with this, these last two verses. Never walk away from someone who deserves help. Your hand is God's hand for that person. Wow. Never tell your neighbors to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. So he gives a sense of urgency. Hey, we can do it. We can, we're to influence our world today. Last verse. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. There is darkness around, but we can be light. And it dispels darkness. And your, and your night will become like noonday. So he uses that metaphor. Hey, you can be light in darkness. You can be that. And then he goes on with this other metaphor. He says, and the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. He's not talking about just summertime. He's saying, he's talking about a culture. It's another metaphor saying, hey, we can be in a culture. It just feels like nothing good is growing. He goes, God will be there. He'll satisfy you. He'll bring the rain. He's going he's to use you to make things better, and we get to do it together. I love that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. Well, I want to just take a moment, and this is our opportunity to respond. Arguably, this is the most important time of the service, really, because it's our opportunity. God's been speaking to us through the songs and through his word, and now it's our chance to say, God, here's my response to that. And I believe that there's two responses that God's looking for today. Some of you, his response, he's looking for you to be that influencer. You can do more. God wants you to do more, and he will help you, and you will find blessing there. You'll find God's favor there. He'll be there with you. You're not on your own. He's going to satisfy you in a sun-scorched land. And so some of you need to make a commitment to God and say, you know what, I've, I've kind of taken a back seat just watching all of this. Just kind of overwhelmed. And when we went over these seven areas, every one of us can impact one of those. Some of us more than one. Say, God, help me to do my part. So speak up about my faith or in my family, to be salt and light there first. Or maybe some other area. Certainly at work. In the people, your world. People you live around. People that you see when you go to a restaurant, the same restaurants, the same grocery store. All the, We can be that person. And if you're Struggling with fear. God is the one. You know, 365 times the Bible says, fear not. He says that because we struggle with it. 
feeling ostracized, feeling oppressed, feeling fearful about our, our livelihood, our resources, God says, I'll be there for you. And then there's a second response, I believe, that God has some of you and that from some of you, and that's some of you, if you're honest, you're, you just need to start in that place when it says the Spirit will prompt you. Some of you, the Spirit of God has been prompting you to get close to Him. If you're honest, you're, you're far from God. You're, you, maybe you just took, maybe years ago you were closer. And somewhere you just took a wrong turn. And then maybe you were resistant for different reasons. And, but the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you. God's been encouraging you, wanting you to say, hey, it's your moment. This is it. And today, right now, this is the moment you're to respond. Will you go to God and you say, I'm, I'm, ready, to give, I'm ready to give you my life, God. I want to serve you. I want, I want you to be in my life. I want you to give me the purpose and the meaning. I'm not going to try to drive that from the world. And that's some, some of you need to do that. So with every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just going to invite you in just a moment to pray with me and to say, yeah, I'm ready to receive Christ. I'm ready to experience this life in the Spirit. What does that look like? Well, when you put your faith in Christ, the Bible says that Jesus forgives you. He comes and lives inside you, gives you strength, encouragement, peace, gives you meaning in your life. And some of you need that. He's, God's been working on you on that. And you need to make a decision right now if you're ready to do that. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or to stand, but I'm going to ask you to pray right where you're at. And I want you to let me know that, hey, Andy, I want, I want to be included in that prayer. I'm ready to put my faith in Christ. I'm ready to receive that forgiveness and the power that he offers. And if that's you, with every head bow, every I closed, I'm going to ask you just to let me know I want to be included in that prayer and do that by just raising your hand right now, okay? Just lift your hand high. If that's you, bless you, bless you. I see you. Yep, bless you. In the back, I see you over there. Bless you. Anybody else? Say, I'm ready. To, I want to include. Yep, I see you. Okay, I'm going to ask you to put your hands down now, and I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to ask you to pray along with me, Okay? Just kind of right where you're at, whisper under your breath, however you want to do it. You just go to God and say, dear God, today I want to receive Jesus Christ and his forgiveness for me. Come and bring your spirit in my heart. Give me purpose and meaning and give me strength to live this life. And give me the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the greatest miracle. Would you celebrate? Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.